Arts, the, at the beginning of it. Museum. And on behalf of the museum and the art department, and it's wonderful visiting artist lecture series, I want to thank you all for coming today. And thank you also for joining me in recognizing the amazing work that Sam Albert does. So um, I have followed, as some of you have, his, um, his career and his projects for many, many years. And it's, I'm just really excited and really honored to be able to have the American Quran here um, at this university at this time when we live in a very surreal world. And for all of us, I think we all recognize that liberty is not something to be taken lightly. And we need to really work toward that. And to that end, art is even more important in sustaining us and to bringing us together and thinking about how we can make the world a better place. So um, I hope that you will go back and see the show. If you've only seen it a few times, it's there for one more week through the 19th. And tomorrow at 5.30, 5.30 we're bringing Serena Grill, who is a professor at Yale University, who will be speaking about the exhibition from her perspectives. And also, um, at the end of her talk, Sandow and Zarino will have a conversation. We'll see how that goes. So that's at the museum at 5.30. So a little background on Sandow, who is a Los Angeles-based artist and a graduate of the Otis Parsons Art Institute. Um, his work, I, I would call him a social practice artist. He's probably broader than that, but so much of your work relates to what is happening in our world today and how we can think about it and uh, how it can activate us um, in regard to that. Um, he has dealt with such topics as inner city violence, graffiti, social and political issues, travel, prisons, Islam, surfing and skateboarding. Um, he's been recognized with many awards and a few and residencies, and here are just a few. He's been a recipient of an NEA International Travel Grant to Mexico City in 1995, a Guggenheim Fellowship in 1996, and a Fulbright Fellowship to Rio de Janeiro in 1997. In 1999, he was awarded a Getty Fellowship for Painting, followed by a City of Los Angeles Fellowship in 2001. In 2007, Sandow was awarded an Artist Research Fellowship at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. And the next year, he served as an artist in residence at the Cité Internationale des Arts in Paris. And a few years later, in 2011, had an artist residency at the Fallon Glen Arts Foundation in Ireland. In 2014, he was named a United States Artist Night Fellow. So we're really fortunate to have him here today. Um, he's worked on many, many projects. Some of you may know him because of the um, Divine Comedy project that he worked on and that has brought him to Eugene and the university maybe twice before, including showing an animated film that he created called Dante's Inferno. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to see that, but it's really wonderful. And that was released in 2007. Um, he has had numerous shows, individual shows, group shows around the U.S. and abroad. And his work is in many private and public collections. Probably about half the work that's in the American Quran show is already in public and private collections. So we're really um, grateful to the many lenders for that exhibition because they've been without their work for over a year and, are, and, and perhaps mid, much longer. Um, Sando is also represented by three different galleries. Some of you attended the conversation we had with Katie Clark, Clark, the Catherine Clark Gallery in San Francisco when the show opened. He's also represented by um, Coplin Del Rio, which is now in Seattle, and PPOW in New York. Um, and I think that's where I'm going to leave it. We decided, Sando and I talked a little about this, and the last time he came, he really focused on American Quran and took us on a gallery tour through the exhibition. I'm sure you will discuss that tonight, but we thought it might also be useful for you to see what he does in many respects. So please join me in welcoming Sando. Thank you. Uh, 
Hi, that's nice for someone that paints alone in a room all day to get that kind of re reception. Thank you all for coming. I'm really happy to be here. I'm surprised to see so many people here, and I've had such a great relationship with the University of Oregon. I've been here, I think this is my fourth time, and I've had such a great time working with Jill and her whole staff at the Schnitzer Museum who have put on the fantastic show of the American Crown Project, and working with Gina Psaki and the Dante studies, uh, romantic language studies, and so uh, I'm really happy to be here. I'm surprised that you all came to see me talk. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a painter. I'm not a professional speaker. I sort of muddle through and do the best I can. Um, but I have been here before speaking about Dante, and I've been here before speaking about the American Quran Project. But uh, since I thought maybe tonight I would be speaking mostly to art students, um, I thought I would sort of change up, and rather than talk about specific projects in depth, I would try to just sort of do a really quick run-through of uh, sort of how I became an artist, and how I work as an artist, and how it sort of functions, and how I get an idea, and that leads to another idea, and another idea, and another idea. Because that's something that no one ever taught me when I went to art school, and <laughs> I wish someone had. <laughs> uh, I grew up in, in Orange County in the suburbs of Los Angeles. Uh, uh, I lived a few miles from the beach, and when I was a little kid, I could ride my bicycle to the beach. Uh, I started surfing when I was 11 years old, and I skateboarded and surfed. And I mention it because, as you'll see as I go through, a lot of the way that my life and artwork has come about has this thread of being a lifelong surfer involved in it. Um, uh, I, went to, uh, I went to the Otis Art Institute in downtown LA in the, in the 80s. Uh, I didn't really like school when I was in high school. Being a surfer, I used to ditch school and go to the beach. Uh, I used to go to punk rock shows and, and, and things and was sort of anti-authoritarianism person. So I didn't like school in high school. When I got to art school, I didn't really like art school either. Uh, so I did two years of art school, and I dropped out. And with a friend of mine, uh, we got in our car, and we decided we wanted to see Carnival in Rio de Janeiro. And we decided that we were going to try to drive from Los Angeles to Brazil. <laughs> so we set out, and uh, spent three months driving through Mexico until the car blew up and sold it and went from Mexico to Brazil by bus. It took us eight months. <laughs> we arrived in Rio de Janeiro one day before Carnival. We had a fantastic time dancing in the streets. <laughs> and uh, when Carnival was over, we were nearly broke. And the next day, we got a job in a surfboard factory. And I ended up living in Rio de Janeiro for four years. Uh, it was a fantastic time to be in my 20s and single and living in Rio. <laughs> uh, but I, I used to go to Brazil almost every year, so I have quite a connection to Brazil. And it had a big influence on my life. Eventually, I just was working in the surfing industry in Brazil, and I, um, I sort of got tired of it. I said I really wanted to be an artist ever, after having spent that little time in L.A. in art school. I, I knew that I wanted to be a painter, and um, I followed uh, a job offer to go work in a surfboard factory in England and in France, ran out of money after that, and called my parents, and they said, well, we'll send you some money if you go back to college. So I enrolled in the exchange program for Parsons School of Design in Paris, and spent a semester in Paris and a semester in England going to school, which had an even more impact on me, uh, because in L.A., when I went to art history class, we would go sit and look at slideshows like you're doing now. In Paris, we'd meet in the Louvre itself and look at the paintings uh, right in front of us. And, you know, I was really just amazed at sort of the scale of the paintings and the, the whole sort of 18th and 19th century French painting where, you know, when painting was so important, it was, they were like painters were the most important people in Paris, and people would buy tickets to look at paintings and stand in lines to look at paintings, and the paintings were like the size of movie screens. So that whole sort of romance about painting really struck me. 
uh, I eventually went back to Los Angeles. Uh, <laughs> I moved into this building, the, <laughs> uh, this storefront building. Uh, a lot of my friends were renting dumpy storefronts in bad neighborhoods in L.A. because they were cheap. And I finished my last year of college at night. And so I started living in this storefront, which was my studio. And I was working for L.A. Packing Art Moving Company and working for art galleries and things. Finished my career, uh, my school career, and then you know got my four-year degree that said I'm degree in painting and had my studio. And I'm sitting there, and it was like, well, you know, now what do I do? <laughs> I'm supposed to be an artist now. And I had no idea what to do. Uh, so for several months, I sort of floundered around. And then I started to think, well, I, I can't think of anything to paint. I don't know what to do. And I started thinking about that, that sort of literary you know, sentence that they say is that you should write what you know. And I thought, well, maybe I should just paint what I know. Well, what do I know best? Well, I've been surfing since I was a little kid. I know surfing. So I thought maybe somehow I could do some paintings about surfing, but how could you do that? So then I started looking at, well, how did other people paint things about surfing? And I started looking at things like this and things like this. And I was like, well, wait, these, these are like, you know, I'm a surfer. I go surfing all the time. And this is like nothing like my life as a surfer. My life as a surfer is like, you know, I got to go to work at 9. So I get up at like 5 and I get in my car and I drive across L.A. in really bad traffic. And I get to the beach in the fog, in the cold, and I find quarters under this car seat to put in the parking meter. And I go out serving with a couple of guys. <laughs> and I was like, these paintings have nothing to do with like, <laughs> what my experience of being a surfer in the city are really as. And I said, well, if, if these people aren't painting what surfing is, well, and I started thinking, well, maybe I should think about you know, the paintings that I saw when I was in, in school in Europe. And so I started looking at the, you know, these paintings. And then I was started to get depressed and said, wow, these paintings are, like, amazing. Like, I could never do anything like this. Anything I do is going to be, like, a failure. And, <laughs> and then finally one day I just said to myself, well, wait a second. I'm never going to make paintings as good as these, but maybe I could just sort of copy them. And so I started doing paintings where I was taking famous compositions of maritime paintings and turning them into surfing paintings. <laughs> so I was taking paintings like Watson and the Shark and turning it into a painting about surfing at Malibu. And again, I was you know, working all day in art galleries and things, and I'd come home at night and drink beer and paint, and I was these paintings were really big, painted on backdrops that I would get at Home Depot. And so I was doing big paintings like I had seen in Paris, and I was painting about surfing. And of course, nobody was looking at them at all. But it was the spark of an idea, and it was a spark of a way for me to work as an artist. And, and you know, part of the idea was that surfing had been, you know, in the general population's idea, surfing is sort of this gidget activity of palm trees and barbecues and 1950s and bikinis. But, you know, real surfing that goes on is like, you know, wetsuits and in the cold and in Oregon and, and you know, all over the place. And so what I wanted to do was show that, you know, surfers were, they weren't these beach-loving people, but they were coming from this maritime tradition of exploring and fishermen and Christopher Columbus and, and things like that. And... So I was doing paintings like these. This is my version of the purchase of Manhattan Island from the Indians. <laughs> and so the Indians in my paintings always represented the surfers because the normal people think like the Indians are sort of uneducated and surfers are uneducated. And then like the white men are bringing culture to them. And you can see in the boat they're unloading paintings, <laughs> which was my job every day was unloading trucks with, from paintings. And then in the background, you see Manhattan as it is, as it was when I painted the picture, and guys surfing in the water. And in the foreground is Robert Rauschenberg's uh, monogram sculpture with an arrow through it, <clears throat> the goat with the tire. So for a couple of years, I was doing, I was living in this dumpy neighborhood in South Central Los Angeles, and surfing in the morning and working all day and painting at night. 
And I was doing these big surfing paintings that were nearly as big as what you're looking at. Um, again, like trying to take like the, all the history of the ocean and like crunch it into one image. So in this picture here, the ship in the center is Captain Cook's ship, the Endeavor, which sailed all around the world and dis, you know, discovered New Zealand and Hawaii and things. And then on the far right on the horizon is the Battle of Midway from World War II with airplanes bombing aircraft carriers. And then in the foreground, there's two guys surfing on the waves. And then in the front, there's the stereotypical sailor's knot. So it's sort of kind of crunch the history all into one painting and tie surfing into something more important than what people think it should be. And then, so I was living in this dumpy neighborhood and, and hanging, you know, hanging out with my artist friends. And uh, gradually I started to sort of move on mentally from the idea of surfing paintings and started to look at the city around me and the place I was living. But I sort of carried on the same idea from the studies I had done in Europe. And I started taking um, paintings I had seen in Europe, but doing paintings about my neighborhood. And this would have been in the, like around 1990, and it was sort of the rise of hip hop culture, and the first LA uh, all hip hop radio station came out. Um, and I was taking these uh, paintings that I had studied in school and reimagining them as uh, scenes of inner city violence and drive by shootings and the drug scenes, drug deals that were going on in my neighborhood and things. And this was really the early days of like the movie Boys in the Hood and the Crips and the Bloods and the Blue versus the Red and this whole sort of rise of gangster rap and this romanticization of violence. And I saw a big tie between you know these romantic uh, 19th century paintings of warfare in which you know the glorious hero was dying and the clouds were parting and the beam of sunlight was hitting him perfectly in the head. And the way that they're sort of making warfare and, and violence romanticized was really similar to what I thought was going on in, in hip-hop culture at the time. So for another couple of years, I was doing all these paintings about my neighborhood. And then uh, in 1992, the Rodney King beatings happened. Uh, and then the... This is perhaps before some of your lifetimes, which is sort of shocking to me. But um, then, uh, you know, the, the police were caught on videotape beating Rodney King, and then there was a trial that the cops should go to jail for beating him up, and then the verdict was they were not guilty, and that sparked four days of riots in Los Angeles that are the worst riots in the history of the United States. And... Uh, at the time, I was living by then in a different storefront in East Hollywood, uh, sort of in another bad neighborhood in L.A., a neighborhood which was really hit by the riots. And so suddenly, um, here I was like living in the midst of like the riots and these times that when you lived in L.A., it seemed like it was a, it was like a, what's you know a pivotal moment in the history of the city people were coming up and saying you know everything's got to change now the city's got to get better we got to make all these changes and it just seemed like suddenly this the whole world was paying attention to Los Angeles and here for the last couple of years I had been doing these paintings that were sort of spoofing the idea of history painting and making fun of European history painting and suddenly these events were happening in my own neighborhood that seemed monumental and historic and it sort of became uh, a big question to me as an artist about, you know, it's easy to make fun of history paintings, but is it possible to make real history paintings when real things are important? And so, this is uh, my painting of uh, two of the police officers that were actually caught on tape beating Rodney King, and it's a painting of them arresting him. This is a painting of uh, Reginald Denny, who was pulled out of his truck. He's driving a cement truck in South Central LA when the riots started and he was beaten by these four guys. And it was all shown live on television, filmed from a helicopter. And the four guys went, all were arrested later and they went to trial. So this is my painting of that event. Um, this is sort of reimagining the LA riots through the eyes of the French Revolution, which I had studied in Paris. 
So the woman in the middle is meant to symbolize the city of L.A. So she's wearing like a Raiders cap because the Raiders was the football team in L.A. at at that time. And the flag she's holding is the flag of the city of L.A. And she's sort of carrying a sign that says no justice, no peace and like leading the people to fight for justice. But in the background you see people sort of taking advantage of of that and looting and taking away televisions and things. And then on the bottom right corner, you see the newspaper that says not guilty, which sparked the riot. This is my painting of my fictional imagining of a real event in when the Crips and the Bloods actually did get together during the four days of riots and they made a truce between each other to not battle each other while the riots were going on. And when the riots were over, then President George Bush the first flew in by helicopter and did a one afternoon walking tour of the burned neighborhoods, sort of photo op opportunity press thing, and then flew out again. And so this is my painting of that. And you see him sort of trying to console the wounded residents of the city, but on the left-hand side, most people are ignoring him and carrying on looting and things. And so for several years, I was struggling with the ideas of, you know, w- is it possible to paint history in, in the 21st century or, or uh, specifically in Los Angeles? Uh, you know, I've been, most of my life lived in L.A., and one thing that constantly irks away in my head as an artist is that my occupation is to be alone in a room you know, painting away in this way that people have done for 500 years, living in the midst of the second biggest city in the United States where the, one of the biggest industries is the movies and television and music videos and radio. And so, like, why am I doing this ancient thing in the contemporary world? And I still don't know the answer. <laughs> I struggle with it. But this is my painting of the arrest of O.J. Simpson in his driveway in Beverly Hills. So I had graduated from school. I didn't know how to be an artist. I stumbled on this way of working by drawing from the past and making surfing paintings. And then I gradually started to do works about my own city. And then I got contacted by Catherine Clark from San Francisco, who had just opened a gallery in San Francisco. And she came to see me. And there was a young gallery. And she said, I want you to do a show in San Francisco. And I said, that's great. I'm happy to do the show. It's fantastic. And she said, no, no, it's not that easy. I think you should come to San Francisco and hang out a little bit. And I said, well, I've been there like twice with my parents when I was a kid and done the cable cars. She says, no, no, I really want you to come to San Francisco and get to know the city and see the art scene because I've never shown an artist that's not from San Francisco and it's kind of a small world. And I said, okay, great. Uh, So uh, I went to San Francisco and spent a month. I, I had a friend up there who was also an artist and a skateboarder, and I spent a month sleeping on his sofa and uh, surfing in the morning and painting in his studio in the afternoon and going to bars at night. And uh, you know, we'd be every, almost every night we'd be sitting in some bar in the Mission, and you know, you sit at a bar stool and you start talking to the person next to you, and people would say, "Oh, well, where are you from?" And I say, oh, "I'm from LA," and they would say, "Oh, you're from LA? That's..." horrible that's the worst city in the world like it's so polluted the traffic's bad like you know everyone's phony it's they just go in this tirade about how LA is like the worst place to live and like the first day it was a little bit funny and the fourth day it was a little bit less funny and by the 15th day it was kind of annoying and by the 30th day I was so sick of people like bashing LA I just said you know I said to myself I said I I think LA should just like invade San Francisco and take over the whole place and put an end to this whole thing. (laughs) And from that idea, I started a whole series of paintings called The Great War of California. (laughs) And as you're going to see, as I start talking about more projects, I I tend in my career to get a little bit of an idea like this, and then sort of unknowingly, it just becomes much bigger than I ever intended. So I started doing this series of paintings about Los Angeles invading San Francisco. And uh, it sort of grew, and I had a show of it at the Clark Gallery in San Francisco, and it was 
it was all sort of another spoof about the idea of history painting and what is history and you know the jokey idea that California and the West Coast doesn't really have very long history. You know, California is 150 years old and Paris is 2,000 years old. Um, so it was joking about not only the history of California and real events, but also the history of history painting and is it, you know, again, the idea of is it possible to make history paintings in the 21st century? So the project grew and grew, and it was a scene, all these sort of battle paintings and military paintings. There's paintings of generals. This is a, one of the generals of the army, and it grew into this whole story, you know, where LA invades San Francisco, and then a, a year later I had a show in LA at my gallery in which San Francisco counterattacks, <laughs> and then I had another show about a, mili uh, a naval battle, and that was in the gallery in San Francisco. So the second time the show opened, they opened on the same weekend. And so in order to see the whole project, you had to go between both cities to the two different galleries to see the whole thing. And so it sort of grew and grew. I started doing these uh, fictional war, you know, war posters that would be raising money for the war. Uh, and it grew and grew and uh, became a big project and then it became a, a, a big museum show at the Laguna Art Museum so that in the end it became about 120 paintings and drawings and maps and posters and models and things and it was all shown at the Laguna Art Museum and it was called The Great War of California and the whole museum presented it with like fictional wall panels and things as if it was a whole war that actually had occurred and nowhere in the museum did it say that it was fictional. And it became, they made a book out of it, and eventually, you know, San Francisco rises up again and comes down the coast and, and attacks and surrounds L.A., and in the whole narrative of it, you know, all seems lost, and L.A. is, like, calling for help from San Diego, but San Diego is, like, obsessed with the border wall, and they call for help from Las Vegas, but Las Vegas couldn't care less. And finally, when at the very last, when all seems lost, the only people that will come to their help is the army of Tijuana that <laughs> charges across the border to save East LA and their brothers and the peace is resolved and Mexico retakes California in the end. <laughs> so it, in the end it became like a five year long project that was really well received and was really fun and besides it being funny and, and things, it was also talked about serious subjects like you know, water issues and gay rights and all kinds of things were involved in, in all of it. But by the end of that project, I was really sort of burned out on it and ready to do something new, something completely different, which is another way I tend to work. I get these small ideas and they get big and then they're done and then I'm done with them. So like I always do, when I don't have any idea about what to do, I usually go to the library or start going to museums and looking at paintings that I really like. And I started going and looking at... Um, what interests me in art history is sort of these parts of art history that are like the, the side roads that, that are, you know, they're forgotten of the normal trajectory of art history where one thing follows the next. And so I was really interested in... Uh, 18th, 19th century American landscape painting, which, you know, Albert Beardstead, there's all these fantastic paintings by these artists that came from the East Coast, you know, right before photography was invented, and they came out in the wagons, and they painted pictures of, you know, uh, Yosemite, and Yellow, what would become Yellowstone Park, and the Grand Canyon, and they'd take them back to New York and the East Coast, and they, you know, there was sort of these propaganda paintings for, uh, you know, Western migration and manifest destiny and all these things. And they're, they're amazing paintings, and you can see quite a lot of them, especially around the Bay Area in different museums. And in L.A., there's many at the Huntington Gardens and things. So I was looking at these, and I was reading about them. I got several books about, about them from the library, and I was reading about, you know, these painters and their optimism and this, this whole idea of the West uh, as sort of the future of America, that the America could expand out to the West Coast and that California in particular was like the Garden of Eden where you could pick the oranges off the trees and find the gold in the ground and it was always sunny. And so this whole sort of 
idea of you know California being uh, you know, gar- Garden of Eden on Earth or something. And for about two weeks, I was really reading these and driving around the city and looking at these paintings in person. And then one day, I'm sitting in my car, probably in traffic or something, <laughs> and there's the radio on, and just out of, like, not even paying attention, but out of my ear, I hear on the radio, someone says that California has the largest percentage of people in, in prison of any place on Earth. And it was just like this shocking sentence to me because I was so immersed in this idea that California was you know, the future and the Eden and this wonderful place. And I'm like, well, wait a second. 150 years ago at the gold rush, it was the best place in the world. And in 150 years, it's become the most locked up people on the planet. And then I just thought, wow, prisons. I've never really thought about prisons. Maybe I should go look at a prison. And I thought, as I always do with these little tiny ideas, like, Maybe I could paint pictures of prisons. How many could there be? Like 10? (laughs) So I said, yeah, I'm going to paint pictures of prisons. And I started going to prisons in California and painting pictures of them. And I found out there are actually 33 state prisons in California and eight federal prisons in California and countless city jails and county jails and things. So I set out to paint every state prison in California, all 33 of them. And it took me three years, and I did. And over the course of the project, I learned more about prisons than I ever intended to. Um, For example, (laughs) the oldest prison in California is San Quentin. You know, when when the gold rush started and San Francisco started as a boom town, and suddenly there was fights in the streets and they needed a place to lock up drunks, and they built San Quentin Prison. And it wasn't too many years before that was filled up. So then they took, they took the overflow of prisoners and they made them walk from San Quentin to Sacramento. And they put them in Sacramento in tents right here on the edge of the American River. And they had the prisoners build their own prison, which became the second oldest prison. And it's Folsom Prison. It was built out of the rocks from the river of, uh, in Sacramento. And... It still exists. Uh, It's quite an old place. San Quentin and Folsom Prison both have museums. If you're ever in the Bay Area, you can drive right up to the front gate and say, I'd like to go to the museum. Uh, Other interesting things is I learned is that every single California license plate is made in Folsom Prison. But what I would do was I would look up the Department of Corrections uh, website and get the addresses of some prisons and get a map out and find maybe five that were sort of in one region and I'd do like a two-day drive and go to visit all the prisons I could and, and just drive out to the address and see whatever I could see. And then I'd go home for a couple of months and paint pictures of them and then I'd go out and do it again. Um, the sort of sad and interesting thing was many of the prisons were in beautiful places that Albert Beardsat had painted out in rural areas. This is Los Angeles Correctional Facility uh, and Juvenile Detention Hall, which is in Lancaster. This is Ironwood Correctional Facility, which is way out near the Arizona border. Um, so sometimes, like this one, you couldn't get within two miles of it. It was so far out in the desert and there was fences around it. But the majority of the time, you could drive right up into the parking lot and go into the front door. And uh, most of the prisons have gift shops <laughs> in, where they sell things that the prisoners make in their art classes. And you can get like little hand drawings and paintings and stitchings. And I got a really cool ring that says Folsom Prison on it, made in a jewelry class. This is Terminal Island Correctional Facility, which is in L.A. Harbor, which is almost visible from where I live now in Long Beach. And this is San Quentin Prison in the fog. You can barely see it there in the, on the horizon. So, again, mostly talking about the process of how I get this one idea, and it sort of grows bigger than I expect it to. And then I, I saw every prison in California, and I was done with that. <laughs> Uh, it became a show and became... Uh, it was a show in Santa Barbara at the Santa Barbara Museum 
and it became a book which you can still find on Amazon and things. So I was tired of thinking about prisons and talking to people about prisons. And luckily, right about then, I got contacted by this place, the Hui Noe Visual, Hui Noe Ao Visual Arts Center. It is a 70-year-old art school on Maui, and it's up in the hills uh, near Makawao in this tiny little rural village. And it's built on the grounds of an old pineapple plantation, and it's this, now it's this tiny little art school that sort of chugs along because not many people live there, and they don't really have any money to keep it going, and, and this and that. So right around this time, they hired a guy named Paul Maloney, who was a printmaker who studied in San Francisco for 10 years, and then he went to Japan for 10 years, and they hired him back from Japan to run the print shop of the art school. And he came in, and he did a program where he would invite different artists from all over, from Japan and all, all around the world, and you'd come to Hawaii and do a project with them, and they would publish the prints and then sell the prints, and the prints would make money for the school to keep going. So he called me up and said, do I want to come work with them? And I said, I don't really know anything about printmaking. I didn't study it in school. And he said, it doesn't matter. The, you know, the surf is good. <laughs> so I went over there uh, uh, for three weeks, and like I always did, I went to his library, and I started looking through his books about the history of printmaking, and stumbled on these beautiful prints in his, in his books uh, called The Miseries of War, which were done by a Belgian artist named Jacques Callot in the 1600s. Here at the oh, they are? Here? Oh, great. Go see them. <laughs> but uh, they're really interesting. They're not very well known in art history, which appeals to me. Uh, they were done in the 1600s, and there's 18 little prints. They're about the size of a dollar bill, and they tell the history of the Thirty Years' War from the beginning to the end. And the remarkable thing about them in art history is they were, rather than being commissioned by the king or the church and being saying, you know, war is glorious and everything, they were really sort of anti-war in that they show the war begins and everything's going good, and then the soldiers start to like burn the houses and rape the women, and then the people uprise against them, and in the very last scene, the soldiers are all coming back from the war with their legs missing and, there's, and things like that. And they're sort of some of the earliest sort of anti-war art that's known, and they're also, turns out, they were the inspiration for Goya's work in the 1800s of the Spanish Civil War. And so it was interesting that these works were done in the 1600s and Goya's works, which are more famous, were done in the 1800s. And then now it was the 2000s and the U.S. was in the middle of the war in Iraq. And so I said to Paul, maybe we should do a series of prints about the war in Iraq, which I was quite opposed to. <clears throat> and he said, yeah, that's a great idea. We can do these little etchings just like the, the Calo etchings. And my wife who's also an artist, says, no, I have a better idea. Rather than do little etchings about little etchings, why don't you do something really big about little etchings? And Paul said, that's an even better idea. So Paul said, let's do wood block prints. And we jumped in his car in Maui, and we drove his pickup truck down to Home Depot and got the biggest piece of wood we could find, which was 4 by 8 plywood, and started doing, uh, from that little idea, a whole series of prints about the history of the war in Iraq from the beginning to the end, which hadn't occurred yet. And so what I would do was, this is a drawing I did that's about the size of a placemat, and this was the first in the series. And you can see on the horizon on the left the twin towers and a plane about to run into it. And then down below you see people reading the newspapers that say WMDs and Iraq and you see people in the middle arguing about it. And on the far right under the tree, you see college kids signing up to join the army. And in the middle, they're saying goodbye to their parents and going off in helicopters to join the war. So this was done as a little like this, a pen drawing like the size of a placemat. And we went down to Kinko's in Hawaii and put it on the Kinko machine and blew it up to four by eight feet and taped it all together and glued it onto pieces of plywood and started carving through it. And this was all Paul the printer's idea because I didn't know how to do any of this. So that's me and my wife carving through the paper. And you can see we made these huge plywood woodblock prints. That's Paul 
rubbing his brow because he's tired. That's my wife, Elise. And you can see the block prints. And so by this spark of an idea and finagling, we got convinced Paul that we should do 15 wood block prints about the war in Iraq, which became a project that took a year and a half and five trips to Hawaii. <laughs> but uh, it was a big project, and Paul had several interns from the Rhode Island School of Design that worked on it and it became this whole series of prints. This is the second print from the series that shows the troops training and getting ready to go off to war. Uh, this is seen from the Battle of Fallujah, and that's sort of a cartoony version of the actual mosque in Fallujah that the Americans were fighting for. And this was right when the internet was sort of a new thing, so most of the pictures were done uh, at the time I was still getting the newspaper every day and cutting the pictures out and had files of pictures of the soldiers of the war going on and sort of cobbling together these images based on that. And <clears throat> so this project took a year and a half or two years, and we'd be working on it, and uh, my wife and I would go to Hawaii for a couple of weeks, and we'd carve a, usually like three wood, wood block plates, and then we would go home to L.A., and, and then Paul and his printers would print them for a couple of months, and then when they were ready, we'd go back and do three more, so I would go back to L.A., and while they were working on the prints, I would, was carrying on this idea in my head about the war in Iraq, and I started doing a series of paintings that went along with them. But all the while, like, really becoming obsessed with the war in Iraq, um, you know, following it every day in the newspaper, reading all the stories, looking at maps, and, you know, all this kind of stuff. This is the hanging of Saddam Hussein was one of the last ones we did. And then these are some of the paintings I was doing. Again, struggling with the idea of history painting. This is a really large painting called The Liberation of Baghdad. And it's an ironic imagination of uh, you know, what we were told was going to happen by George Bush and Donald Rumsfeld. That, you know, that we, we're going to take over Iraq easy. This is going to be a cakewalk, and we're going to roll right in, and the Iraqis are going to be happy to get rid of Saddam. And they're going to come out with can, you know, with flowers and candies for us. And of course, we all know that didn't happen. <clears throat> sort of reimagining Orientalism paintings with American troops. This is the president's dream: George Bush bringing freedom to Iraq on a magic carpet. <clears throat> and then, you know, by the time we were working on this project, the war in Iraq was already six, seven, or eight years in and with no end in sight. And the problem had shifted from opposition to the war to, you know, it wasn't really, are you against the war? It's like, how is the U.S. ever going to get out of this war? And so this painting is sort of the mysterious riddle of foreign people messing with the Middle East, the riddle of the Sphinx. And so for those two years and so, really obsessing about the war in Iraq, thinking about it all the time, listening to NPR all the time in the, in the, in the, in the studio in Hawaii, we'd be all working on it and and, you know, really listening to this discourse that was going on about people would be on the radio arguing about Islam. Is Islam, you know, fundamentally at odds with Western civilization? Is Islam an uh, intrinsically uh, violent religion? Is it, you know, is it something that we can't understand and all this? And during the course of this time, it started to sort of dawn on me that, you know, I've been a surfer my whole life. I, I travel two or three times a year to places to go surfing and I always have, and I started to think, wait a second, I've been to Islamic parts of the world many times, and I started to count them, and I think I counted 10 or 11 long trips I had spent in Islamic parts of the world. And it sort of dawned on me that I've been to these places. These places are fantastic. The people I meet are amazing. The food is wonderful. The, the mosques are interesting. This is the whole way that America is talking about Islam is not the same as I experienced it. Um, for example, this is a surfing trip to Java in Indonesia. This is a mosque in Java. 
My wife's mother is from the Philippines. We went to visit her family in the Philippines. This is a mosque in Mindanao in the Philippines. This is uh, Tangier in Morocco, where I've been several times. This is me surfing in Morocco. This is me in front of the largest mosque in Africa, in Casablanca in Morocco, in which you can surf right in front of it. And so I started thinking, the Americans are not understanding Islam, and, and I don't know anything about Islam either, but maybe I should learn something about it and, and stop listening to people on the radio tell me what Islam is. And so one day I went down to the local bookstore in L.A. And, and bought a paperback copy of the Quran and started reading it. And gradually I started going to the library and looking at, you know, getting books out about the Quran and learning about it and looking at historical uh, Qurans. And then on yet another surfing trip in Ireland, I was with some friends and we were wandering around a rainy afternoon in Dublin uh, sightseeing and we stumbled on this place by accident, the Chester Beatty Library in Dublin, which is right next to the Castle of Dublin. And I went inside and it turns out they have the second largest collection of Qurans in the world outside of Egypt. And suddenly here I'd been thinking about the Quran and reading about it and suddenly there was like glass cases with a thousand years of Qurans like all laid out in front of me. You know, these beautiful handmade traditional Qurans that I had been looking at in reproductions and was thinking that they're just so perfect and, and tiny and perfectly made that you know, there's no way that you could create anything that sort of rivals them. But then once I went in the, in the library in Dublin and saw them firsthand, suddenly you could see them close up and you saw, oh, wait a second, they make mistakes and there's erasings and they fix parts and you know, they go outside the lines and things. And suddenly they seemed like not the perfect things I was seeing in coffee table books, but they seemed to be these real handmade, wonderful things. And from that sort of spark, I thought, well, maybe I could make an illuminated manuscript myself. And again, from that tiny little idea, I got myself over my head into a project to create an illuminated manus <clears throat> manuscript of the Holy Quran which is what's here at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum. And I, when I began, I thought it would be, take me about four years. It ended up taking nine years, um, but it's finished. <laughs> and it's, it's really amazing. <laughs> and again, just like with prisons, I didn't know anything about it when I began, and now I know quite a bit about it. <laughs> uh, so it's up for a little bit more. If you get a chance to walk over there and see it. And you know, the idea was to take the, uh, what I did was I hand transcribed the entire English language version of the Quran by hand uh, and followed the traditional formats of these thousand years of Quran making with these little, you know, with the border decorations and the medallions that mark the verses. As you can see, they count the verses by tens, twenties, thirties, and the margins. And then each little gold dot in the text marks a verse. And that's a traditional way that Qurans are, are made. And then uh, the, the images are all scenes of life in the United States today, which are metaphorically tied to the text. So in this instance, it's a passage that talks about Noah's Ark and the flood. And the scene is of New Orleans and Hurricane Katrina. And this obviously is about divorce. And this is a passage that talks about how when societies are evil, you know, God sends punishments down on them like he did to Lot and uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and things. Uh, and this is a passage that talks about how God's word is spread around the world by different ways. So it's a scene of a person writing graffiti. This is a passage that says that um, one of the reasons you can believe that God, when he warns you, that you can believe in what he says is because you can travel around the world and you can see the remnants of civilizations that have existed before and have been wiped out. And so this is the dinosaurs that's no, that no longer exist. And this is a really sort of poemic, metaphorical 
short passage in the Quran about a charging herd of camels, which I have no idea what that's like. <laughs> but I tried to imagine what might be sort of awe-inspiring as well in our own world. <clears throat> that project is finished. Uh, it's been finished for about two years now. And I'm going to wrap up by talking about uh, the work that I'm doing today. Um, around, at some point in this, this process, uh, I got uh, invited to be artist in residence at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. Uh, so it was two months in, in D.C., and I got like a backstage pass to go to any of the Smithsonian museums, and I could go in the back rooms and meet with the curators, and if I wanted to see something, they'd take it out of storage and things. And I had not... You know, I'd probably been to D.C. as a teenager or something, but I wasn't familiar with it. So again, I was like, I got there and I rented a little apartment and then I was being like a tourist the first week and going to see everything. And, you know, one of the things that sort of struck me about D.C., you know, D.C. is quite a tourist city and the whole sort of tourism industry revolves around, you know, 1776. It's always 1776 in, in D.C. <laughs> and... The the thing is that D.C. is a functioning city. This is where our new president li- lives. And in buildings like this building, the IRS building, is where people would go to work every day and are doing things like sending me letters about my taxes. <laughs> and so D.C. is not all 200 years ago, the way that the, the tourist board presents it. You know, It's a functioning place that decisions are going on that affect us every day. And so I went and saw the Constitution in the archives, and eventually I started doing uh, a drawing about the Constitution of the United States. And uh, I started imagining it sort of as like an Arc de Triomphe, like I had seen in Paris, like a monumental structure which had the entire text of the Constitution on it, which you could read, because I hadn't read it, and I started reading it, and I thought, wow, everyone should read this. (laughs) I should have read this 20 years ago. (laughs) So this is my drawing of a monument to the Constitution, and the entire left-hand side is the Constitution, and the center is the Bill of Rights, and the far right panel is all the amendments. And you see a little space at the bottom so they can add some more if if they want with a construction crane on the roof. But it's not seen as 1776. Look, you can see it's like a... It's imagined like an apartment building that people can live in and people are going about their business around it. And, and then the scenes depicted are all, in the Bill of Rights section, are all scenes of the ways that the, the 10 Bill of Rights affect us every day still, you know, from simple things like owning guns and freedom of religion and, you know, trial by jury to, uh, you know, that the states, different states can decide what time the bar close and, and how old you have to be to drive and things. Uh, so that led me into being interested in looking at other documents I should have read in high school that never did. <laughs> and I started doing a series of uh, imaginary monuments to important world documents. This is the monument to the United Nations Treaty on Human Rights which uh, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, supposedly wrote in shortly after World War II. And again, all the drawings, it's important to me that you can actually read the actual text of the entire document if you stood in front of it. Um, this is a fictional monument to the actual letter that Christopher Columbus wrote when he first discovered America and his ships were parked off the coast of the New World and he wrote a letter back to the Queen of Spain in which he describes like finding it in these glowing terms and it's really interesting to read. Uh, he says, you know, wow, I found it. It's amazing. Send more ships. There's like gold here. It's going to be fantastic. <laughs> so, and on top of that, you see the, the Spanish-American world, Latin America, colonized by Spain. Uh, this is a monument of all uh, oh this is leading up to the gay rights gay marriage act starting it's a imagine as if it's like a pyramid where at the bottom it's uh, 
r racial r rules about you couldn't marry black people, you couldn't marry Indians and things. And then each successive layer is like the generations, that, the new laws up until the Defense of Marriage Act at the top and then finally gay rights at the top. And this is a monument to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which ended the Mexican-American War in which you know, the United States sort of trounced Mexico and said, okay, um, you got to give us half of your country, <laughs> and in return we will give you $10 million. And this was one year before they found gold in California. And so it's imaginary, as if it's an island in the Rio Grande River between the two countries, and the shape of it is the map of all the territory that the United States gained from Mexico, surrounded by a border fence. And then it says, welcome to the United States, with an unwelcoming fence around it. This is a monument to the NYPD, where the base of it is sort of the gushing thank you flower piles of 9-11 when the NYPD couldn't do wrong and they were the heroes of the world with those, the shards of the 9-11 building and then on top of it all the actual rules out of the police book handbooks about how they couldn't, you know, rules of ch choke holds and how they can arrest people and stop and frisk and all the problems that they've had since. This is a monument to the California prison industrial complex with the tr transcriptions of several Supreme Court cases which have gradually led to the reduction of the prison population. And this is a, an imaginary city of monuments to all the wars of the United States since 1776. And it turns out in the 240 years of the United States, there's only been 28 years when we're not fighting against someone or something or invading someone. And finally, uh, I'm still working with Paul Maloney, the guy that was in Hawaii. He's now moved to San Francisco where he has a print shop. And we've been working on these imaginary monuments, and this is his workshop. And he, you can see he's printing several etchings of uh, the United Nations Human Rights Tower. And that's the project I'm still working on today. So that's what I brought to show you. So thank you. Yeah, uh, well, it was, I'm trying to know how to shorten it, but yeah, the whole riot started because the cops beat up the guy, it was all in the video, and then they got off. So then the riot started, and then these guys beat up another guy, and then they got into trial, and there was all these people saying, like, protests and stuff, saying, let them off, because, like, if the cops can get off, why, then we should let these guys off as well. And so through the whole course of their trial, there's a big sort of, fairness for black versus white and all this. So the halo is to sort of show, is he innocent or guilty? And then the picture depicts them doing what they actually did. Yeah, in the back. Uh, why did you choose to paint like, the buildings and the institutions from the outside? Uh, like, not, why did you choose that as opposed to like, working with people, speaking people like you have been before that? Uh, the reason was because the idea was, wasn't really about individual people. It was more about the concept of, of utopia and what utopia had become, dystopia or something. The idea, and the, and the, the crazy thing that so many of the prisons are actually built in these scenic places that had been depicted by these previous landscape painters, which is really ironic or out their very small windows, yeah. So, it, you know, over the course of three years, 
it got a lot of attention, especially in people fighting for prisoners' rights and things. And I did go into a prison in San Diego and spend a day, and I went to an art class with them. And, but I really sort of resisted getting really involved in that angle. It was a different project, I think. It was more about the in prison and incarceration as an institution and as a, as a problem of society than specific people's problems. Yeah? by ignoring it. Uh, you know, I, I looked at it from a different angle, you know. First of all, what struck me is, you know, a, a lot of people at the dis, this whole discourse about whether Islam is, is incompatible with us or something. You know, they say America is this country that is, the heart and soul of America is the Bible. I'm like, okay, well, the Bible is an ancient book from the Middle East. And the Quran is an ancient book from the Middle East. And as a person, as a non-religious person, like, how could these two books be that different? It didn't really make sense to me. And then if this, and then the other thing that I think about is Christianity is seen as this global thing. It's a message from God, and it goes down to Australia, and Australians can be Christians. No one says Christianity is a Middle Eastern culture. Christianity is a global thing. Well, Muslims think the same of Islam. Islam is a global thing. Islam is not a culture. It spans the globe. There's Australian Islam, Islam Muslims, and there's Indonesians and Indians, and they, have, you know, and uh, interesting things that I've learned is uh, I think only 12% of Muslims speak Arabic. 80% of Muslims do not live in the Middle East and have never been there. So the vast majority of Muslims live in Southeast Asia, they're as mystified about what's going on in the Middle East as we are. And so this idea that Americans have is that Islam is a culture that is at odds with our culture. You know, Islam has many different cultures. And can't there be an American Islamic culture? Uh, the Quran itself says this is a message that's coming down from God. And it's coming down to all the people of the world. And so I said, well, I live in L.A. in 2010. If God is speaking to me in L.A., what does that mean to me? And I just forgot everything about the Middle East. I'm going to the store today. What does this message mean to me on my trip to the store? What does it mean to me when I'm picking up my kid at preschool? Just the way that people think about the Bible. I took it at face value. And I, that's what I did. <laughs> Open to it, I guess. Yes? Did you ever end up painting Alcatraz? Uh, I didn't because it's not open. I didn't. But I did do a, a project. I had a show in New York, and I went to New York and painted all 15 New York State maximum security prisons. Yeah. Yes? I had the pleasure of seeing your horror series exhibition in San Francisco. Has this most recent series been exhibited in one place? These? No, the um, monuments. Oh, uh, no. No, they've been shown in chucks and, and commercial gowns. Yeah. Anything else? <laughs> uh, yeah? What's next? I think I'm working more on this monument for right now. I, I, I find that interesting. In the Quran was really a draining project. It was like 10 years just focusing on this one thing and almost to exclusion of everything else. So it's really nice to, to do these monuments where I sort of find like an interesting document and then read about it for a week and think about it and like over a course of a month make something and then it's finished. So having these short things come up and, and I've done, you know, 
in the course of these monuments, I stumbled on uh, an article in the Guardian newspaper uh, called, I think it's called 100, 100 Documents That Changed the World. And it's great. You just go down the list, and it, like now I have 100 to choose from, and they're all interesting. <laughs> and they have one, you know, not only do they have the Magna Carta and the U.S. Constitution and things, but they have uh, these great interesting ones like the rules of soccer. You know, and... You know, it sounds flippant, but the rules of soccer was four guys in a pub in 1860, and they wrote these rules down in a napkin, and now almost every country in the planet plays this game. So it changed the world. So they're all some lighthearted ones as well. <laughs> yeah? So with your project, how did, like, Muslims and, like, sheiks and stuff take it? Because I assume they like saw it because it seemed pretty big. So, yeah. um, so what were their viewpoints on it? Mm-hmm. They've been really interested and supportive and, and sort of amazed. Uh, <laughs> uh, it showed in part at uh, the school in Iowa, Grinnell College. And I was there and I gave a talk like this about the Quran and I was speaking about it and they had all the Quran pages. And at the end, this guy stood up at the, and he said he was the imam from the oldest continuous functioning mosque in the United States in Cedar Rapids, which who knew was in Cedar Rapids. And he was like, this is a fantastic project. You know, this is, it's, you know, especially college age Muslims, they say, you know, I grew up my whole life skateboarding and feeling like an outsider. And suddenly like my religion and my life is on the same page. This is like the best thing ever. So. It's available on Amazon. You can get it in, in bookstores. It's, it's uh, it's easy to get, so it's worth yeah, looking at. Yes. Oh, they have copies here of the Jordan Schnitzer. <laughs> yeah. I love, I love this collection so much, and one of the things I love uh, so much about it is the color. Are you missing color in your current project, or do you do you miss the um, uh, the expressive options of, of color as you're working on something that is deliberately void of it? Yeah, well, I work on different things. I'm, I have to play music and stuff at the time. I don't have like a major But I mean, when you're, when you're working on the monuments, is, is there ever a moment where you think, you know, this should be blood red? Or, or, or are you really quite... Uh, I, I've thought about it, but I think if I, stood, if I did one in color, I'd have to do a roll in color. I'd be, like, oh. I'd be off in another ten year hundred. <laughs> yeah? Well, no. I, I only I only did a four year degree. I never went to grad school. But I do. I you know up until recently, I, when I've had kids, you know, I live in the city. Most of my friends are artists that I meet from university, and you know, most of my social life was going to art shows and museums and hanging out with artists and. So I felt like I'm part of the LA art scene. Yeah. I, I think I am. I don't know what they think of me. <laughs> yeah. Yes? No? Yeah, I skipped over it. It came right before the Iraq War project. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So your final degree was from Otis? It was. I have a they took all those transfer credits and everything. <laughs> Reluctantly. I had to read many things. But yeah. Uh, I'm BFN in painting. Yes? You were introduced as a social practice artist. Uh, are those the words that you would use to describe your practice? I don't describe my practice, but I would, I think, I kind of think of myself as conceptual. <laughs> you know, I think, uh, I, get, I, I have shows and I'll get reviews of my shows and say, well, his paintings aren't, he's not a very good painter. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I don't think I'm a very good painter. I think, but I think the idea is really good <laughs> and I'm painting the best I can. So I think that like, I think that in my work, the idea is the most important thing and then I just try to make it as best I can. But I, there's a ton of people that paint way better than me, for sure. Yeah? <laughs> yeah? Have you gotten a response from Muslims from Middle Eastern countries on your on the American framework? 
not, not as much as I would have hoped. Uh, it did get a book review like in Saudi Arabia that was really difficult to translate, and it was in a newspaper in Indonesia. And my Gowrie's trying to get into the Dubai Art Fair next year to take it to the to Dubai. So it hasn't it hasn't got as far as I, I I wish those people would know more about it. I hope it will happen. <clears throat> Yeah. When you describe like listening to the radio and having that epiphany, do you then think like, oh, I'm going to devote ten years to this one idea, or is it more of like a gradual? <coughs> it's gradual. Yeah. It's like, oh, this will be one good painting, and oh, now it's two, and now it's three, and then it's <laughs> twenty, and then wow, they get more and more, and then, yeah, it never starts out like thinking. That's, but it happens over and over. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But American Crime is a little different because you knew if you were going to do this, yeah. you had to buy all the paper or certain things yeah. that you thought about, not knowing it would take 10 years, but like, yeah. you, know, you had to plan for it. Yeah, it, it, that's true. And because I had done the Dante project before, which grew and grew, and then so I knew what it, was, what it took to make a book, and I knew all the steps involved. And, so, yes. Well, thank you for coming. Happy to answer anything else.